Hello, everyone. Uh, we very much welcome uh, to our new webinar called Nutrition for Immunity, Stronger Immune Systems Through Healthy Nutrition. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. My name is uh, Jaime Costa, Jamie, if you wish. I'm a practicing, very proud community pharmacist, and I have the honor of being now serving uh, the FIP as the community pharmacy section professional Secretary. In the next uh, slide, uh, we will see uh, some announcements. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and live streamed via YouTube. The recording will be available on our website uh, very soon after the webinar finishes at the address uh, that you can see on screen, events.fip.org. Uh, more than uh, uh, you, you may ask questions, but you are highly encouraged to do so. It's not only a May. Uh, we will be very grateful to have your input after uh, each speaker or during uh, the webinar uh, in general. And you can use, please, the question box uh, provided. You are also very much welcome to provide your feedback to webinars at FIP.org. That information uh, will help us to improve uh, the activities we are delivering uh, to you, to, to uh, pharmacists all around the world. And please consider becoming a member of FIP at the provided email, uh, at the provided website address. Sorry, we just finished our uh, FIP conference and it's been so great to see so many colleagues from all around the world. FIP provides you with a very interesting network of colleagues all around the world, uh, pharmacy leaders, uh, and the uh, chance of uh, upgrading yourself by accessing very um, uh, evidence-based uh, information uh, and also uh, to FIP conference, which um, uh, as I said, the FIP Seville one has uh, finished uh, just a week ago. So in the next slide, uh, we will see, uh, we would uh, like to thank uh, Halion who has provided an unconditional grant. Uh, so you can access this webinar free of charge. Uh, so uh, food for thought, uh, pharmacist rolling healthy nutrition is a three event mini series uh, continued under the theme Food for Thought. This series began with a digital webinar on the basics of nutrition and nutrition services in pharmacy, expanding uh, from the recent 2021 FIP report Nutrition and Weight Management Services, a toolkit, a toolkit for pharmacists, which is available to you in the FIP uh, website. Today, uh, very timely, we will highlight how nutrition impacts immunity its importance in supporting a strong and responsive immune system, as well, uh, very importantly too, as the role that pharmacy plays in general. The third and last event will examine the interlinks, interlinks between nutrition and heart health and its role in the prevention and management of cardiovascular diseases. And you are very more welcome to attend that webinar too, that will be uh, marketed through FIP um, uh, channels, social media, emails, etc. So in the next uh, slide, it's my pleasure to introduce you to today's panelists and a super big thank you uh, for them uh, for taking that time in the very busy day-to-day um, uh, -day life and uh, be so generous to share their expertise with you. First, uh, Philip Calder, president of the Federation of European Nutrition Societies and professor of nutritional immunology at the University of Southampton. Uh, second, Basma Abdul Samad, a clinical pharmacist and uh, an expert in immun immunology and allergy. And last but not least, for sure, uh, Joanna Hartnett uh, from Australia, who's a senior lecturer uh, at the University of Sydney Pharmacy School. I will introduce them uh, properly after they, they begin their um, presentations. So, in the next slide, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce you properly to Philip Calder. Uh, Dr. Philip Calder is an internationally recognized researcher on the metabolism and functionality of fatty acids, with an emphasis on the roles of omega-3 fatty acids and on the influence of diet and nutrients on the immune and inflammatory responses. He has received many awards and prizes for his work, including the American Oil Chemist Society Ralph T. Holman Lifetime Achievement Award in 2015, the prestigious Danone International Prize for Nutrition in 2016, and the DSM Lifetime Achieve Achievement Prize in Human Nutrition in 2017. Um, uh, Dr. Calder is currently serving as president of the Federation of European Nutrition Societies, 
um, uh, until 2023, and is an associate editor of Journal of Nutrition, Clinical Science, Nutrition Research, and Annals of Nutrition and Metabolism. Dr. Calder is also the head of the School of Human Development and Health at the University of Southampton. Dr. Calder, thank you so much for being with us today. The floor is yours. We are all ears and eyes to your presentation. Great. Uh, th thanks very much, Hemi, for your very kind uh, introduction. And thanks very much to everyone who's shown up uh, for some of you at inconvenient time of day uh, to attend what I think will be a really interesting uh, session here. It's very timely, timely as uh, Hemi mentioned, uh, a lot of people, uh, consumers, uh, medical and healthcare professionals, governmental bodies, of course, very interested in this area of nutrition and immunity. <clears throat> operate my slides here and um the so can you move to the yeah thank you i don't know if that was responding to me or not so um uh harmful microorganisms things like bacteria and viruses can make us sick and we call these microorganisms that make us sick pathogens but it's really important to note that not all bacteria and viruses are harmful some of them are harmless and even some are helpful. And I'll say a little bit about that later on. Nevertheless, we have these pathogens, these harmful microorganisms in our environment and the immune system is the cell and tissue system that our body has to protect us from harmful organisms, bacteria, viruses, uh, also parasites and fungi. So the immune system is our protective mechanism. A well-functioning immune system is key to providing good defense against pathogens. And we're absolutely certain about this because people who are immunosuppressed or immunocompromised, so with weakened immune systems, are at greatly increased susceptibility to infection and of infections becoming more severe, even fatal. So there's a link between a competent immune response and protection against pathogens. Here I show the four general functional features of the immune system. So firstly, it acts as an exclusion barrier to keep pathogens out. So you could imagine uh, things like the skin, the mucosal linings of the gastrointestinal tract, the respiratory tract, the genitourinary tract. These all keep uh, bacteria out. The acid pH of the stomach kills some bacteria. And also we have proteins and secretions like tears and saliva that uh, mop up uh, bacteria. Secondly, the immune system can recognize uh, organisms if they invade, it, and it can identify them as being harmful or harmless. This recognition and identification is key to, way how, to the way the immune system protects us. The recognition occurs through generic uh, recognition of particular structural features, we call them patterns, on the surface of organisms, or it occurs through our specific antigen receptors. Thirdly, the immune system acts to eliminate those organisms it's identified as being harmful. This is actually destruction, the killing of bacteria, for example, through processes like phagocytosis, bombardment with reactive oxygen species, and release of proteins that kill uh, uh, bacteria or virally infected cells. Finally, the immune system has a memory component. So it's able to remember its immunological encounters. And therefore, if there's reinfection, the response is faster and more vigorous than it was the first time. The memory response is the basis of vaccination, which of course is very topical right now. So the immune system can recognize and identify, it can eliminate and it can remember. So it's very complex, it's very sophisticated. And this complexity and sophistication comes about through the different cellular components that go to make up the immune response. In general, we divide immunity into innate immunity shown on the left and acquired immunity shown on the right. So the barrier functions that I mentioned are part of innate immunity. Some of the recognition functions are part of innate immunity and some of the elimination functions are part of innate immunity. 
For example, the cells that carry out phagocytosis, the engulfing and destruction of bacteria, are part of the innate immune system, the phagocytes. Acquired immunity, uh, so innate immunity is really to general features of uh, invading organisms. Acquired immunity is the specific response to particular antigens. This involves T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. The B lymphocytes are the cells that produce antibodies. The T lymphocytes, some of them are active against invading uh, organisms. Others are controlling uh, and modulating the whole immune response. So we have regulatory T cells, for example. There is a connection between innate and acquired immunity because antigens are presented from the innate immune system to antigen-specific T cells in the acquired immune system. That's one of the links. And then the T lymphocytes from acquired immunity actually control the activity of cells that are part of the innate immune system. So we have within this complicated system cells with specialized functions. You, so you can uh, imagine this a little bit like the different instruments in a musical orchestra, for example, or the different components within a military force. So they each have their own individual roles, but they have to work in a coordinated and integrated fashion if we're going to mount a proper immune response. As I've already mentioned, weak immunity equates to poor defense against harmful infections, and that increases the risk of infection and of infections being more severe. So people have become interested in the factors that influence the immune response. So here are some of the factors. They include things like our genes, medications, infection and infection history, vaccination, but also they include many uh, lifestyle factors, cigarette smoking, alcohol consumption, how physically fit we are, how stressed we are, but they also include a lot of things to do with nutrition, which is our topic today. So body fatness is important, frailty is important, nutrient intake is important, and the gut microbiota are important. And I'm going to say something about all four of those uh, aspects. So what's clear is lifestyle factors are really important. So on the right, we see those factors that weaken immunity, stress, sleep deprivation, smoking, excess alcohol, obesity, and a poor diet. And on the left-hand side, we see the factors that support immunity, being physically fit, and having a good diet. So diet is really important. Before going into that, I just want to introduce you to what I call periods of immune vulnerability. So when we're born, our immune system is poorly developed, and we have weak immune responses. Anyone who's had children will know that young children, uh, babies and infants are very susceptible to infections, uh, to respiratory tract infections, to gastrointestinal infections, even to skin infections. And that's because their immune system hasn't developed and matured, but it does that over the first few years of life. On the right-hand side, you see I've depicted here that the immune response um, declines with age. And this is even given a name, so age-related immune decline is called immunosenescence. So just as other bodily systems like musculoskeletal system, cognitive system can decline with age, so the immune system declines with age. And of course, our immune system is protecting us against infection. So again, that means older people can be at greater risk of infection. So there are a lot of uh, uh, different features of age-related immune decline. One of them is all of our immune cells are produced in bone marrow. And as we age, there's reduced output of new immune cells from bone marrow. Our T lymphocytes mature in the thymus and they're released from the thymus into the bloodstream. And as we age, our thymus becomes smaller and there's reduced output of new T lymphocytes from the thymus. What this means is older people often have lower numbers of T lymphocytes in the bloodstream, and they have an altered balance between what we call naive and memory T cells with fewer naive and more memory T cells. Fewer naive T cells mean older people are less able to respond to new uh, uh, immune um, exposures. Also T cells, B cells, antigen presenting cells and neutrophils all have decreased function with aging, so the immune system just doesn't work so well. Paradoxically, 
there's an increase in low-grade inflammation with aging, and that increases risk of uh, non-communicable diseases like metabolic disease, heart disease, and even cognitive decline. But the uh, immunosenescence, the age-related immune decline, means older people have weaker vaccination responses, they have increased infection risk, and they have poorer wound healing. So this is an example uh, from recent research. This is the response to the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccination in, um, in uh, adults aged less than 60 and in older people. So on the upper left, we have the antibody response to the first vaccination with, young, with um, adults aged less than 60 in blue, adults aged over 80 in green. And you see the antibody response, which is on a log scale, is much, much weaker in the people aged over 80 than those aged less than 60. In the middle at the top, we see the response to the second vaccination, where again, the vaccination is weaker in, or the response to vaccination is weaker in the older compared to the younger adults. The pink area is the antibody response that's required for the vaccine to be effective. So this shows the first vaccination in older people is not sufficient to be effective. This is a very clear depiction of age-related immune decline, and this was already known for the uh, seasonal influenza vaccination. So there's an effect of aging on the immune system, and this is made worse with, made worse, uh, with frailty. And this is shown in this study here using the influenza vaccination in older people. So on the left, we have the antibody response to the three components of the seasonal flu vaccine, H1N1, H3N2, and B. So these are three different influenza virus strains that are included in the vaccine. So, sit, so you can measure the antibody response to each of these three components of the vaccine. So there were 71 people involved in this study. The left-hand bars on the left-hand graph show the antibody response to the three components. It turned out that 17 of these older people were frail, 22 were not frail, and 32 were identified as pre-frail. And what you can see is that for all three uh, components of the vaccine, the frail individuals mounted really weak antibody responses compared to the non-frail individuals, and the pre-frail individuals were somewhere in between. So even amongst older people, so these were all roughly the same age, um, the, it's not just an effect of aging per se. On top of that, you have this adverse impact of frailty. On the right is these same individuals looking at influenza-like illness or lab-confirmed influenza in those individuals post-vaccination. And if you just look at the right-hand graph on the right-hand side, that's lab-confirmed influenza, where even though 30%, even though all of these individuals were vaccinated, 30% of the frail individuals developed influenza compared to only 5% of the non-frail individuals, showing there's a clinical impact of this weakened vaccination response, and the weakened vaccination response is because of the weakened immunity in those older people. Let's turn away from aging and frailty and look at overnutrition now. So although people sort of didn't recognize this very well, there's a lot of documentation about the impact of obesity on the immune system. And this has been largely ignored until COVID-19 came along. And then people realized that after aging, obesity was probably the single biggest risk factor for severe COVID-19. But if you go back in the literature, there's plenty of documentation in humans that obesity impairs the activity of many of the key cells of the immune system, the T cells, the B cells, natural killer cells, and so on, reduces antibody responses, decreases the production of interferon gamma, which is a key cytokine in the antiviral immune response. It was already known that obesity increases susceptibility to infection and meant that uh, people didn't respond well to some vaccinations. This was known but ignored. There was a flu pandemic in 2009 where it was identified very clearly that people with obesity did much more poorly than normal weight individuals. There are all sorts of other things around vaccinations and so on that are known in obesity but were ignored. 
This is a study where the researchers took blood uh, from healthy weight, overweight, and obese individuals, and then they studied the immune cells from the blood in the laboratory, and they stimulated them in the laboratory with the flu vaccine, and they measured three different antiviral and anti-vaccine immune responses. Um, and it doesn't matter the detail of these responses, but you see if the cells came from people who are obese, the cells function less well than if cells came from healthy weight people. And again, overweight people were in between. So obesity impairs immune cell responses. And as I already mentioned, obesity decreases um, the uh, response to the flu vaccine. And this is actually from a systematic review, if I remember rightly, showing that people with obesity are twice as likely to develop the flu even though they're being vaccinated against the flu uh, compared with normal weight individuals. Again, showing this adverse impact of uh, obesity on the immune response. Let's now turn to individual nutrients. And people have often struggled with the idea that nutrition is important to support the immune system. I don't understand that struggle at all because nutrition is important to support all of our bodily systems. But here I list seven reasons for nutrition supporting the immune response. The first is that the immune system requires a lot of energy when it's active, and the fuels for energy generation, of course, come from the diet. The second is the immune response is highly biosynthetic. There's a lot of proteins being made, antibodies, cytokines, acute phase proteins, entire new cells. And of course, all of the building blocks uh, that the immune system needs come from the diet. Thirdly, some micronutrients like zinc and vitamin A are important regulators of the molecular and cellular aspects of the immune response. Some nutrients are substrates for making chemicals involved in the immune response. Very good example would be arginine is the precursor for making nitric oxide, and nitric oxide is a potent antimicrobial um, agent. Turns out some nutrients like zinc and vitamin D have specific anti-infection roles. For example, they inhibit viral replication. The sixth one on the list is as part of the immune response, uh, we create oxidative and inflammatory stress that are harmful to microbes, but they're also harmful to ourselves. So we have to protect ourselves against the harmful aspects of our immune response. And that's where the antioxidant vitamins the minerals that are part of our antioxidant uh, enzymes, many phytochemicals, the flavonoids, for example, play a role. And then finally, as I'll show you in a few minutes, our gut microbiota is a really important determinant of our immune response. And outside of antibiotics, our diet is, our main, is the main uh, modulator of our gut microbiota. So here, things like fiber, prebiotics, again, phytochemicals are really important in creating a healthy, diverse microbiota. So people have been studying the impact of nutrients on the immune system for decades now, and we know a lot of um, uh, essential and non-essential nutrients are really important for supporting the immune response. These include the fat-soluble vitamins like A, D, and E, and even vitamin K, although that's understudied water-soluble vitamins, the B vitamins, vitamin C, lots of minerals, zinc, copper, selenium, and iron, manganese, magnesium, lots of others, uh, many essential and non-essential amino acids, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, other essential fatty acids. These are all important. Indeed, this is, for some of these nutrients, this importance is recognized by the European Food Safety Authority which um, permits uh, health claims around maintenance of function of the immune system for vitamins A, B6, B12, C, D, folate, and for zinc, iron, selenium, and copper. So EFSA is sufficiently convinced of the vital role of these micronutrients in the immune system that it permits health claims around them. Now, this is a little bit hard to see. I'll explain what's going on here. The larger boxes are the different components of the immune response. They include on the left, 
things to do with innate immunity, and on the right, things to do with acquired immunity, antigen presentation, T cell function in the bottom right, and B cell function in the middle at the bottom. So the, what the authors have done here is they've divided up the different parts of the immune response. And then in those gray colored circles, they show the micronutrients that are really important for supporting that part of the immune response. So if we look in the bottom right at uh, T cell mediated immunity, we see vitamins A, D, C, E, B6, B12, folate, and zinc, iron, copper, and selenium are all vital to supporting T cell function. So multiple micronutrients support T cell function. But those same micronutrients are repeated many times over in this figure. So multiple micronutrients are vital to support multiple aspects of the immune response. So if a person is deficient in one or more of those micronutrients, their immune system isn't going to work so well. That's been very well described. So a good supply of important nutrients means you're helping the immune system to work well, and that means you increase your likelihood of having good defense against pathogens. So there's a direct link causal chain between nutrition, immunity, and infection. Of course, if you turn that round the other way, inadequate nutrient supply, malnutrition, micronutrient deficiencies mean we have uh, inadequate nutrient status in stores, that weakens our immune system, and that means we are less able to defend ourselves against pathogens, so more infections, more severe infections, infectious illness, and even death. Now, the impact of what we eat on our immune system goes beyond the mainstream nutrients, beyond the vitamins, the minerals, the essential amino acids, the fatty acids, and so on. So many compounds of plant origins, plant origin phytochemicals, for example, things from spices and nuts, uh, beta glucans, for example, from yeast, have a role in immune training. Prebiotics, which modify the gut microbiota, probiotics that modify the gut microbiota. So the impact of what we eat goes beyond mainstream nutrients into these other uh, dietary components. That brings me on to the gut microbiota, which I mentioned in passing before. So the gut microbiota is one of the main uh, regulators of immune maturation and of immune activity. And this is the sort of beautiful figure you'll see in review articles. So what we have is the gut lumen is at the top with all of the microbes present in the gut lumen. Then we have the epithelial cell monolayer that separates the gut lumen from the body. And then we have immune cells within the gut wall. And in fact, there are immune structures within our gut wall called Peyer's patches and lamina propria that mean the immune system is interacting directly with our gut microbiota. The gut microbiota is communicating with our immune system. And conversely, our immune system is communicating with the gut microbiota. So this is a bi-directional interaction that aims to um, educate our immune system and for our immune system to control the growth of harmful organisms. Now, although we usually think about immune cells in our bloodstream, actually about 70% of the human immune system is associated with the gut wall. So this gut, this gut associated immune system is really, really important to maintaining health. Now, I listed before the lifestyle factors that are important for our immune response, the things that weaken immunity and the things that support immunity. And it turns out the same things that weaken immunity adversely impact our gut microbiota, whilst the same things that support immunity promote a healthy, diverse gut microbiota. So all of the nutritional things I've been talking about with regard to the immune response are also important to gut health and gut microbiota. And in fact, gut health and the immune system go hand in hand. So just to summarize, a well-functioning immune system is required for effective defense against pathogens. Impaired immunity predisposes to infections and impaired immunity weakens vaccine responses. And I've showed you examples of that from aging, from frailty, and from obesity. 
but this also holds up in micronutrient deficiencies, for example, and even for gut dysbiosis. The immune system is weakened with obesity, with frailty, with malnutrition, and with micronutrient deficiencies. And I believe that weakened immunity is an under-recognized result of these factors. People never talked about obesity and immunity pre-COVID, for example. Problems with death from COVID in old people in care homes, some of that's related to aging, some of that's related to frailty. Both of those things impair people's immune response. I went on to tell you that multiple nutrients, including a lot of vitamins, minerals, but also other nutrients and also some non uh, classical nutrient components of the diet play important roles in uh, supporting the immune system and low intakes of these will impair the immune response and make people more susceptible to infections. And we know the situation can be prevented or reversed by repletion. This is very well described in the pre-COVID era. So overall, I think nutritional strategies should be part of the approach to preventing infections, to optimizing vaccine responses, and to promoting recovery from infection. So we have both a preventative aspect in supporting the immune response and helping vaccines to work, but also we have this uh, uh, post-infection effect, I think. Now, of course, diet is really important here. All of the things I've talked about come from the diet. Diet controls our gut microbiota. But I think the reality is supplements may be necessary to achieve the intakes of some of the key nutrients that are important for supporting the immune response. Then the other thing is we really have to focus on good nutrition as a preventative strategy for infection. And I think these, some of these ideas will be taken up by the other speakers. So just coming to the end now, actions to support a healthy immune response maintain a healthy weight and body composition. That's both fat tissue and muscle tissue. Keep physically fit, reduce stress, sleep well, eat a diverse, well-balanced, mainly plant-based diet, and maybe consider a supplement for those nutrients that are hard to get enough of from the diet. And I think vitamin D would be a very good example of that, but there are lots of others as well. Thanks very much for your attention. I'll hand back now. Thank you, Dr. Connor, for an excellent uh, presentation with very practical uh, advice and lots of information. It was very interesting. So now it is uh, my turn to introduce you to Dr. Basma Abdul Salman. Uh, Dr. Abdul Salman, sorry for my pronunciation, is an experienced clinical pharmacist with a master's degree in immunology and allergy, skilled in medication reconciliation, presentation skills flow cytometry, clinical research, immune assays, and pharmacy practice. Strong healthcare services professional graduated from ESCRT, postgraduate Harvard Medical School. Thank you, Dr. Abdul Samad, for being with us today. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Jamie, for this lovely introduction. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Philip, for the great, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, now I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the dietary supplement. Does it really help to boost your immunity? This is our question. We are going to answer it today. So what are the dietary supplements? Dietary Supplements Health and Education Act defined the dietary supplement as a product that is intended to supplement the diet, contains one or more dietary ingredients, such as vitamins, minerals, herbs, or other botanicals, amino acids, and other substances or their constituents. Also intended to be taken by mouth as a pill, capsule, tablet, or liquid, and is labeled on the front of the bottle or the panel as being a dietary supplement. So uh, the available dietary supplements in the market, they will be in the form of vitamins, multivitamins, or individual vitamins, for example, vitamin D, E, and so on. Minerals such as calcium, magnesium, and iron, 
botanicals or herbs such as echinacea and ginger, botanical compounds such as caffeine and curcumin, amino acids such as tryptophan and glutamine, and the live microbials, which are probiotic, probiotics and prebiotics. The regulations for dietary supplements, first of all, they are regulated as foods, not as drugs. And also, the FDA is not authorized to review the dietary supplements, products for safety and effectiveness before they are marketed. So what happens if a product is found to be unsafe after it reaches the market, not before that, the FDA can restrict or ban its use after reaching the market. So who is responsible for the safety and effectiveness of the products? The manufacturers. Manufacturers are responsible for the product's purity, safety, effectiveness, and the list of ingredients and their amounts written on the bottle. And there is no regulatory agency that makes sure that labels match what's in the bottle, which means you may get less or more of the listed ingredients and sometimes all of the ingredients may not even be listed on the bottle. So um, the dietary supplements with immune boosting potentials uh, famous to enhance immunity in the market are micronutrients and phytonutrients that serves as antioxidants, including vitamin C, D, E, zinc, selenium, which um, is, uh, which is famous to enhance antiviral defense against influenza strains, including H1N1, in, in uh, carotenoids, polyphenols, gallic acid, which is a powerful anti-inflammatory and antiviral properties that can stimulate natural killer cells and macrophages, but the human resources is limited on the gallic acid. Other dietary components involved in the immunity include magnesium, amino acids, nucleotides, medicinal mushrooms, omega-3 fatty acids, B-complex vitamins like B12 and B6, and the propolis. Propolis is a resin-like material that honeybees produce for use as a sealant in the hives. It has an immune-enhancing effect and may also have antiviral properties. Uh, other examples of the dietary supplements are the medicinal herbs with various antibacterial and antiviral effects. They may also support immune functions by optimizing cellular processes during both the innate and the adaptive immune responses. Example of medicinal herbs, curcumin, boswellia, undergravis, echinacea, elderberry, golden seal, garlic, soja, thyme, oregano, and there are many other examples in the market of medicinal herbs. So the question here, do vitamins or herbs supplements really help? Animal studies have found that a single nutrient deficiency in zinc, selenium, iron, copper, folic acid, and vitamins such as vitamin A, B6, vitamin C, D, and E can alter immune response. And as Dr. Philip mentioned earlier, they are very important to the immune system and they have a vital role in the immunity. But the question, how can we get those vitamins and minerals? I think that eating a good quality diet can prevent deficiencies in these nutrition, in these nutrients. However, there are certain populations we can call risk groups that can't fully benefit from nutritious food to, due to different problems such as the malnutrition, malabsorptions, and so on. And those great risk groups really need vitamins and mineral supplements to help fill nutritional gaps. So who are the risk groups that needs those immune boosting supplements? First, we can give examples like patients with absolute vitamin deficiency. They have a real deficiency in certain vitamins, critically ill patients in the hospital. Of course, they need extra supplementations with vitamins and minerals and so on. Pregnant and lactating women like uh, folic acid and maybe iron, calcium, vitamin D infants and toddlers, elderly with chronic diseases, such as the CKD patients, they can't benefit from uh, vitamin D. They may also need calcium, vitamin D, and iron, and so on. Children with malnutrition, they of course need multivitamins to enhance their immunity. And lastly, the low-income households. 
But my question here, does dietary supplement boost the immunity of healthy individuals? As a clinical pharmacist or even a community pharmacist, a lot of people keep asking you about different uh, products or supplements to enhance their immunity, as can I take a zinc, can I take vitamin C, uh, do, you, do you recommend any uh, immune boosting herbs or something? What is the question here? What, is, uh, what, what can you answer them? Most of the people believe that if vitamins are not effective, at least they are safe. Is it true? Is vitamins and minerals always safe? In 2012, a large meta-analysis combining severe randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled primary prevention trials designed to reduce risk of major chronic diseases. So these studies were intended to uh, study the effect of uh, the, the effect of dietary supplement to reduce the risk of major chronic diseases. And the study included large number of participants, such as 29,000s, 18,000s, 22,000s, and so on. And different studies studied different types of dietary supplements, such as the alpha tocopherol, beta carotene, vitamin E and C, and calcium and vitamin D, and so on. But the results of the large scale randomized trial show that for the majority of the population, there is no overall benefit from taking multivitamin mineral supplements. Indeed, some studies have shown increased risk of cancers in relation to using certain vitamins. Also, a recent study in 2021, uh, it was a randomized control trial. Uh, it was intended to uh, study the effect of high-dose zinc and ascorbic acid supplementation on symptom length among ambulatory patients with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the study concluded 82 men and 132 women. They were divided into four groups. The first group received the standard care. They were uh, 50 patients. The second group, 48 patients, received ascorbic acid. Third group, 58 patients received zinc, gluconate. And the last group contained 58 patients, and they received both zinc and ascorbic acid. The primary outcome of the study was the number of days required to reach a 50% reduction of symptoms, such as the severity of fever, cough, shortness of breath, and fatigue. The findings... Unfortunately, this study was stopped because there was no benefit, no significant difference among the four groups. As we can see here, the four groups are similar. No benefit from, uh, uh, no difference between the four groups. In this randomized clinical trial of ambulatory patients diagnosed with SARS-CoV-2 infection, treatment with high-dose zinc, gluconate, ascorbic acid, or the combination of the two supplements did not significantly decrease the duration of symptoms compared with standard of care. And as much people believe that vitamins uh, is not um, if it is not effective, at least it's safe. This sentence is not true because a lot of vitamin, more than you need, a lot exceeding the recommended intake for adults, it may cause a potential toxic effect. As we can see in this table, vitamin A, if exceeding the recommended intake of for adults, it may cause hepatotoxicity, visual changes, hair and skin changes, teratogenic effect if taken above 10,000, 15,000 international units per day, also potentially increase the risk of hip fracture at intake above 5,000 international units per day. Beta carotene also can increase risk of lung cancer among smokers and people with apostasis at intake above 33,000 international units per day, yellowing of skin, diarrhea, and arthralgia also. Vitamin C can also cause diarrhea, gastric upset at intake above 2,000 mg. Vitamin D can cause soft tissue calcification or hypercalcemia at intake above the 2,000 international units. Vitamin E can cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, possible antiplatelet effect, headache, fatigue, and blurred vision at intake exceeding 800 international units per day. Vitamin B6 can cause sensory neuropathy, ataxia, if regular intake exceeds the 200 milligrams per day. Vitamin B12, no upper limit known. Further studies is required to indicate the upper limits for adults. 
Uh, niacin can cause vasodilatation, gastrointestinal upset, hyperglycemia, and potential interactions with the statin, the antihypertensive drugs, and hepato effects may occur if the intake exceeds 3,000 milligrams per day. So the sentence of vitamins are always safe, it's not true. Also minerals, minerals taken as supplements can also be toxic. Magnesium can cause diarrhea at doses above the 400 milligrams per day. Phosphorus can cause diarrhea at doses above 750 milligrams per day and mild nausea, vomiting at lower doses. Iron can cause constipation, nausea and vomiting, reduced zinc uptake and iron overload in hemochromatosis. And this is very important. Zinc can increase the immunity in the normal recommended doses, while the above the limit, zinc can cause nausea, vomiting, and also immune suppression and impaired copper uptake. Selenium at doses above 0.91 milligrams per day can cause brittle hair and nails, peripheral neuropathies, and gastrointestinal upset. Also, a large review article combining studies published from 1966 to 2010 to evaluate the effects of dietary supplements on safety and efficacy, clinical outcomes in adult in industrialized countries concluded that except for vitamin D in older population and omega-3 fatty acids for cardiovascular diseases, there was no supporting evidence for dietary supplements used in westernized population, and sometimes it may be harmful. Another large review article combining studies published from 1993 to 2015 with an emphasis on the randomized controlled trials revealed that Taking high doses of supplements like vitamin A, E, D, C, and folic acid is not always effective for prevention of diseases. Here we are talking about the prevention, and it can even be harmful to the health. So what is your rule as a clinical pharmacist or even a community pharmacist? First of all, you have to make sure the patient or the person asking you for the supplement, the OTC uh, herbal medicine, needs this supplement. Is he one of the risk groups? Will he really benefit from this supplement? Second, you have to make sure that he's taking the right supplement for him, not any uh, multivitamin or any help, uh, herbal medicine and so on, and then right doses and right duration to prevent any possible adverse effect from exceeding the limit. Third, Advise healthy individuals for alternative methods to boost their immunity, not just supplementation with multivitamins. So how can you advise them uh, for a healthy lifestyle? Stop smoking and decrease alcohol, of course. Eat a diet high in fruits and vegetables so you can obtain these vitamins and minerals from fruits and vegetables and healthy diet. Exercise regularly, maintain a healthy weight, get adequate sleep at least for seven hours per day. Take steps to avoid infection. Prophylaxis is better than treatment. So try washing your hands frequently and cooking meat thoroughly and steps to avoid infection. Try to minimize also the stress. And finally, keep current with all recommended vaccines available in your country because vaccines are very important. Prime your immune system to fight off infections before they take hold in your body. Our take home message that dietary supplements should not be considered a substitute for a good diet because no supplements contain all the benefits of, health food, of healthy foods. Dietary supplements are not always safe. And finally, following general good health guidelines is the single best step you can take toward naturally keeping your immune system working properly. Thank you. And I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you, Dr. Abdul Samad, for a great presentation. Uh, it, it was very interesting to see uh, how you address the efficacy and safety of vitamins, vitamins and minerals, which is uh, very common to um, have uh, questions about those products in pharmacy. Yesterday, I was addressing a, a senior patient who just had a heart surgery, and she wanted to uh, kind of, uh, of course, uh, have uh, the best diet as possible, and I was talking with her about some potential um, uh, supplements that she could have. And we had a very interesting conversation. So thank you, Dr. Abdul Saman. Uh, now it's uh, the turn, my turn to introduce you to our third, last but not least speaker at all, 
Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Joanna Harnett, PhD, MHSC, BHSC in complementary medicine, and is a senior lecturer at the Sydney Pharmacy School within the University of Sydney in beautiful Australia, where she specializes in complementary medicines, teaching and research. She completed her PhD in nutritional pharmacology in 2013. And her central focus is, is in both teaching and research activities is to foster the appropriate and safe use of evidence-based evidence uh, complementary medicines, including vitamin and mineral supplements. She is a visiting research fellow of the Australian Research Center Complementary and Integrative Medicine at the University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, thank you for being with us, Dr. Harnett. We know that it's a little bit late for you and we appreciate your effort as the other speakers and our attendees. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your introduction and, and thank you um, to FIP for the opportunity to uh, come and share some of my knowledge uh, this evening um, with you. Um, and thank you too to the um, fabulous speakers um, that we have uh, had, Philip and Basma, which is, uh, provides me with a, a fantastic foundation um, to try and bring some of these key messages together in this final presentation. Um, so I would hope that you'll be able to really consolidate in your thinking the intersect between the factors that impact nutritional status and immunity, um, and hopefully some practical help for you around accessing resources to inform that evidence-based general nutrition uh, Dr. advice. Hart, if, if I may interrupt you for, uh, for a second, if uh, we're seeing your uh, presentation mode is uh, uh, um, the the uh, present yeah present interview. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for interrupting you. No, no, thank you for doing that. I apologise. Um, as you mentioned, it is late down here in Australia, <laughs> so my brain is uh, not working quite as sharply as it might earlier in the day. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, I would hope that by the end of the presentation, you'll have um, some really practical knowledge around um, where to look for some of that evidence based. Um, advice around nutrition, particularly supplementation, and being able to engage more broadly in health promotion in the communities that you serve um, through effective communication and, and motivational counselling. So we saw this brilliant um, uh, figure uh, in Professor Calder's um, presentation um, and, you know, the it, just the, the multiple and certainly not limited to these factors that impact our immune response. And what is striking, I think, from the presentations we have just heard, that many of these factors, in fact, also um, impact nutritional status. So our nutritional status is um, a common denominator in the impact these factors have on our immunity. Um, and with my own research and interest in the gut microbiota, um, you know, we have this bi-directional effect and we've heard that over 70% of our immune um, function is actually um, uh, mediated by the intestinal um, it, within the intestinal um, immune system. And that is dependent on this gut microbiota. And what is the very, what's the most um, dependent factor of a healthy gut microbiota? It is the diet. And look, I could go through many of these, but I guess what's very relevant to pharmacy is also uh, the role of, of medications. And we know, for example, that the long term use of um, proton pump inhibitors, particularly in the elderly who may be more frail. And of course, as we've heard, um, immune system function um, uh, declines um, over the lifespan. That the use of these medications long term in that population is associated with um, a B12 deficiency and also magnesium deficiency, both of which we have heard are, are important um, vitamins in the uh, function of immunity or supporting the function of immunity. So being able to play a role as pharmacists in promoting these factors and, and modifiable risk factors uh, for a poor immunity and poor nutritional status is vital. And so these um, 
uh, uh, these, these factors that um, can become part of pharmacists' routine care is a, around promoting the importance of nutrient intake from diet and where appropriate dietary supplementation. But as we've just heard beautifully from um, Basma, the balance between adequate intake, inadequate intake, and the, the um, potential risks of excess intake are really important to consider. Now, from a general nutrition point of view and, and for pharmacists, really, you don't have the time uh, to do individualized nutritional assessments. And this is where I encourage you to um, uh, identify within your professional networks, nutritionists um, or dietitians, depending on, on what people who specialize in nutrition are referred to in your, um, in your countries, that you um, uh, connect with those people and that you have a healthy referral system to those people where it is clear that a person needs more individualized and tailored nutritional advice. And this is with the view of um, ensuring uh, that there are no um, excesses or um, inadequacies um, for those people. So we've heard um, from both the speakers this evening that these are, are um, vitamins and minerals um, that are well established and acknowledged by authorities and those that specialize in immunity and nutrition to play an important role in, in immunity. So what I have done in this slide is I have um, if you hover over any of these underlying points here, it will connect you to the National Institute of Health fact sheets for health professionals about these specific nutrients. So the, um, the considerations that have been proposed by both speakers around um, adequate intake, uh, populations at risk of deficiency, safe upper limits to, present to, to prevent toxicity and side effects, and also the dietary sources of these, um, of these uh, nutrients are all within those fact sheets. Now, I'm sure there are also organisations within your own countries that also have um, authoritative resources on immunity, but I chose the NIH because I personally find it succinct easy to read and valuable um, for being able to, you know, scratch up your knowledge or perhaps learn new knowledge about these particular um, vitamins and minerals involved in immunity. The other thing that I really wanted to, to point out and reiterate here is um, that both deficiency and excess can have deleterious effects on immune function. So we know that if uh, people consume excessive amounts of vitamin zinc um, and raise their plasma or serum levels above those that are considered normal, it can have a um, suppressive effect on copper, and copper is very important in, in, in immune function. So it's, again, that point around balance. But I do hope if you choose to um, use these resources that you'll be able to uh, get some more specific detailed information about appropriate uh, use and diet of supplements and uh, dietary sources. So going broadly um, into thinking about some primary pub, uh, public health strategies. So one of the key things you can do to keep abreast of general nutrition advice um, that relates to um, not only to immunity, but in the healthy function of many systems in the body, including cardiovascular and mental health, is to know um, what these uh, guidelines and policy statements are encouraging both the public, but also, also health professionals to promote. So national nutrition strategies that we've seen over the years include uh, processes, um, uh, projects such as food fortification and iodine and folate are two uh, well-known uh, food fortification um, projects that have been implemented in, across countries to prevent um, uh, deficiencies um, uh, in populations at risk of deficiencies. 
Another action is reformulation of food. So we're seeing an increase in the removal of uh, what I term and others term anti-nutrients. So that foods that might provide fuel, but they don't necessarily provide nutrition um, or nutrients um, or in fact can actually deplete nutrients. And good examples of these would be things such as trans fats, which are a man-made type fat um, that is now known to have detrimental effects on uh, both cardiovascular but also immune function. So the removal of these anti-nutrients and replacements with beneficial um, fats, for example, such as monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fatty acids, is an example of reformulation. But this also gives you an indication of the importance of public health messages around the exclusion um, and the inclusion of those food types in the general diet. The third bullet point here refers to uh, public health uh, recommendations around supplements for specific populations at risk. So we've seen this, for example, with folate um, and the importance of that in pre uh, preventing a neural tube defect. Um, and I believe that over time we're going to see an increase um, in these um, recommendations about supplement use as we become um, uh, better uh, or more knowledgeable about uh, benefits and risks, and particularly where we see from an epidemiological uh, point of view, widespread deficiencies. Another type of uh, public health strategy that can give you an indicator of the type of messaging you might be wanting to give as a health professional are fiscal policies around taxes. So this is where we see uh, governments place taxes on particular foods um, that are known to have or, or food components that may have a detrimental effect, similar to my, what we might see in some countries around taxes with cigarettes and um, um, alcohol. So these being applied to particular food groups and there's been much discussion around um, taxes on highly sugared foods across many nations throughout our world. So primary public health and new strategies um, are really important um, to provide guidelines and advice on the importance of um, varied diets and healthy lifestyles. And you've, we've heard this, you know, we hear this and it's resounding, but unfortunately it falls on deaf ears um, uh, globally for many people. So there's non-compliance with the advice that's been given by these, um, uh, these broader public health messages and results from diet and nutrition surveys across a number of countries continue to demonstrate that there is inadequate micronutrient intakes and prevalence of uh, low nutritional status. But it's not all doom and gloom because we know that pharmacists are, are a health professional and that are considered one of the most trusted professions in the world. You're easily accessible um, and people come into you for um, health advice around medicines. And so you're positioned in a, in a brilliant opportunity to be able to um, convey some of these well-evidenced uh, nutritional strategies um, that are being tried to be conveyed not only by national um, organisations but also by the World Health Organisation. So I would argue you have a, an excellent role to play in health promotion, particularly around nutrition. So what is health promotion? Well, it's the process of enabling people to increase control over and improve their health. And I would argue that pharmacists do that every day um, in their role um, as providing um, information and guidance on medicines use. And so there's a natural progression in my mind for you to be able to also provide um, evidence-based general nutrition advice as well. And we know that um, the evidence uh, worldwide points to the benefits and the effectiveness of, of investing in health promotion programs to de deliver benefits for the communities you serve in promoting well-being, reducing preventable illness and lowering overall health expenditure of nations and indeed the world. So... What is some of this general nutrition advice you can give? 
Um, simple things like referring to the World Health Organization's five keys to a healthy diet, eating a variety of foods as broad as possible. And we've heard about not just vitamin and minerals that are present in those foods or amino acids, but also around these other factors or um, uh, it can, as uh, Philip called them, non-conventional components. So prebiotic and probiotic compounds that are naturally occurring in foods, fibres and also the polyphenols and plant chemicals that we know um, play a critical role in the um, promotion of a healthy microbiota and therefore immunity. Eating plenty of fruits and vegetables, also rich vitamins, minerals, but also these plant fibres and plant chemicals that uh, promote a healthy microbiota and immunity. And eating moderate amounts of fats and oils. Um, so the key here is that we know that um, excessive amounts, particularly of um, uh, these uh, trans fats or excessive amounts of saturated fats um, is associated with um, uh, more specifically cardiovascular disease, but also immunity. And we know there is an interaction between those fats and the composition of the microbiota in our intestines, which as we have just heard, um, is a large part of our immune function. And that we know there are benefits to um, certain essential fatty acids such as omega-3s, and we know that there are benefits to um, monounsaturated fatty acids such as those found in olive oil and prevalent in the Mediterranean diet. And we also know that eating less salt and less sugar is very important for a range of factors and, and more specifically to sugar um, in relation to immune function. So for more specific details on these points that I have made, there is um, uh, the Nutrition and Weight Management Services Toolkit for Pharmacists um, that I was involved in reviewing in 2021. And there are some excellent um, uh, summaries that extend the World, World Health Organization's uh, five key facts to a healthy diet that are I think would be of great benefit for you to study in order to communicate uh, to the people that you serve. So communication is key. So this um, slide here is, is a summary, or a very brief summary, summary of the World Health Organization's um, Effective Communication um, Handbook. And the table here is actually from the toolkit that I just mentioned. So as you can see, there are seven C's to communication. So it makes it relatively easy to remember on how you might communicate general advice more broadly to the people that you serve in your, in your pharmacy. So commanding attention is number one. So you might get a patient's attention about could diet be impacting your immunity would be a one way to um, uh, provoke interest and command attention. The second step is clarifying that message. So the message is um, a balanced diet provides nutrients that support immune function. Communicating the benefit is the third step in effective communication. So we know that adequate nutrient intake and correcting deficiencies supports normal immune function and may reduce the incident and severity of illness. Cater to the heart and the head. So enjoying a healthier winter season is catering to both the heart, but also the head. We all want to feel better um, and more resilient uh, during winter. In creating trust, I think our pharmacists um, already do that by the nature of their profession. And calling to action. So calling to action can be different things. Um, such as messaging around consulting a nu nutritionist to evaluate your dietary needs. So very simple um, but uh, effective ways in which we can frame and develop communication in a style uh, that has been evidence-based and proven to be effective. So my last uh, messaging today is around motivational counselling and about the individual 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 
So motivational interviewing and change talk has five basic principles. Um, and these principles have been, um, were originally developed um, in um, changing behavior around alcohol and substance abuse. But the same framework is now applied to a range of healthy style uh, counseling behaviors, um, including nutrition. So number one is expressing em empathy through reflective um, listening. So one of these, you know, I've put a little scenario here. The patient might say, I want to improve my diet as I know it's impacting my health, but I'm too busy to eat well. So acknowledging that and listening back to that. But also principle two about understanding what the discrepancy is between the client's goals or the values and their current behaviour. So what's the gap? So the pharmacist might say, that's great, you want to improve your diet. And let us think about how you can be available to be purchased and prepare, prepare healthy food. The principle three is to avoid argument and direct confrontation. So the patient might say, I don't have time to shop and cook. In fact, a lot of us may have that response around trying to develop healthy nutrition. So the principle, fourth principle, will be adjusting to the client's resistance rather than opposing it directly. So the pharmacist could suggest, I understand. Let's think about the support or products available to you to overcome that challenge. And principle five is supporting self-efficacy and optimism. So by giving um, some directives that are about empowering that person to make the change that are reasonable within the context of their situation, um, uh, leaves them with optimism that their goal about wanting to eat healthy is achievable. And this might sound really rudimentary, but as I mentioned, these are evidence-based motivational interviewing techniques um, developed um, over 20 years ago that are um, adopted um, across a range of disciplines. So in summary, pharmacists can play a role in identifying factors that impact diet quality and nutritional status. Um, accessing reliable and reputable resources to inform the evidence-based advice on the dietary and supplemental intake. And that was the NIH um, links that I provided to you there. Through providing and being involved in education campaigns that actually align with the public health policies in your, um, in your countries and regions, um, through effective um, evidence-based communication, and then on an individual level, using motivational counselling um, uh, techniques as um, uh, demonstrated in my previous slide. And importantly, understanding that whilst nutritionists, as whilst pharmacists can play a role in general nutrition and public health nutrition initiatives, working collaboratively, collaboratively with nutrition experts is critical um, to ensuring that individualized needs are met. I have provided a set of supplementary slides to help you with um, identifying um, uh, nutrients associated with immunity in the populations that are at risk of deficiency that in the interest of time I won't go through now, but I understand these slides will be available to you. But as you can simply see, there are, depending on the particular nutrient involved in immunity, you will see that there are specific populations that may be at greater risk of um, a deficiency in those um, particular um, nutrients. So I will complete my um, um, presentation now and thank you so much for your uh, attention and interest in this. Uh, topic that I'm deeply passionate about. So thank you, Dr. Harnett. It was excellent, very sharp, despite the time of the of the day to you. Uh, I liked it very much. I, I will highlight uh, the way that you described through motivational interview that we can really support our patients. And uh, it's um, I would wouldn't say it's basic. Uh, I mean, it's it's the our bread and butter. 
in pharmacy. Uh, we are we can be so powerful uh, to help uh, patients have a healthier um, a way of life by uh, using our empathy, addressing the the errors that patients might have, avoiding argument, adjusting uh, to what uh, patients uh, need and support their self-efficacy. So in that sense, building on the trust that patients uh, give us, we have a, a golden opportunity in every interaction to uh, with patients to to uh, to be the tool they they need us to be uh, to support them to have a healthier life. So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so I, I would like to to ask uh, um, our other two panelists for today to open to turn on their, their cameras, and we will go if, if that's okay uh, for the Q and A time. We have uh, some minutes and some questions. So um, my, my, the first question that was asked, I, I will uh, direct it to Dr. Abdul Samad, but of course it can be also commented, as answered uh, by the, our other two speakers. So we, we have a couple of questions regarding, you said that um, uh, supplements are not authorized uh, pre or that they go to the market from the FDA. Um, and it's common in, in that's common in many uh, uh, jurisdictions. Uh, uh, this is, these are not medicines. Uh, of course, there are other mechanisms to, um, if something goes wrong or there's a problem with the supplement, to take care of that. Uh, but we've had a, a few questions about the real, real reliability of manufacturers, what trust we can have in advance in those products if they are not previously um, uh, approved by the national uh, FDA. Yes, we have to be a very um, suspicious about uh, the manufacturer and you have to take care that the supplements are from a good quality manufacturer because as we said, there are no regulatory agency that take care of safety and efficacy before marketing. FDA is only authorized to recruit the supplements if any adverse effects take place after marketing, not before that. So you have to be very careful of the quality of the manufacturing uh, you are recruiting supplements from it. I might just add to that, um, that a question pharmacists can simply ask people that ask um, uh, or supply supplements to their pharmacy is around good manufacturing practice, uh, which is a really important um, component of um, uh, producing any medicine, whether it's a vitamin, mineral or herbal product. Um, so asking if the GM fee, if there is a GMP approved and licensed facility of where that product is made. Um, I will also add that regulatory frameworks um, vary around the world in, in terms of how supplements are um, assessed prior to going to market. So if you have concerns about those that are available in your country, looking to countries with higher standards around GM, the requirement for GMP and also good agricultural practices when it comes to herbal medicines, um, it can also be a source. Thank you, Dr. Culler. Do you, you have any message or comment? Uh, well, the only thing I can add, I mean, these are all, I mean, it's a useful discussion and these are good comments, is um, around omega-3 supplements, which, you know, uh, uh, regulated in general in the same way. Um, but there is an organization which has set standards for omega-3 supplements and, you know, a company can sign up to those standards or can, cho can choose not to, of course. Um, so I think there's, an, there's, I think from the, um, the more trustworthy parts of the industry, there is a desire to, have good practice and good standards, but it's an industry because it started in a very unregulated way can be prone to, um, you know, uh, poor poor management and poor processes. But I think, you know, the advice from the other two colleagues is is good in terms of what to look out for. Yeah, and that's that's very common when we uh, decide our suppliers. Uh, it's, it's very important for us. Uh, it's on behalf of our patients' uh, health. Thank you, thank you very much. So um, um, I would like to ask uh, Dr. K Dr. Calder and uh, our other two spe speakers. Um, you, you talked about uh, senior patients and frail patients, and yeah. it's becoming more and more important because of, of uh, people, uh, fortunately, uh, despite COVID, 
uh, I would say, uh, are uh, becoming older and older. That's a success uh, worldwide. So as, as, what would you advise pharmacists? Uh, what, what would be the, the most important two or three advice that the, they can provide in their pharmacies to, to those patients to avoid frailty? What's the low hanging fruit? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So, I, I mean, that's a brilliant question and there probably isn't a perfect answer. So um, we know as people age, um, their body composition changes. And, you know, one thing that is noticeable for, for many people, of course, is they start um, putting on more fat tissue, so becoming overweight and obese. Um, but the other thing that happens is people can lose um, muscle mass. <clears throat> and often those two things can happen together. And actually the increase in fat mass can disguise this loss of muscle, of muscle mass. Now, with the decline of muscle mass, uh, people can become weaker. Um, and that, that condition is called sarcopenia. But when you layer on top of that something else, perhaps some sort of illness, um, that's when you, you venture into frailty, which, you know, this is a, a downward spiral because of um, loss of mobility and all of those things. <clears throat> so I think, you know, your point that people are getting older and what should we focus on? So I think the three things for me would be uh, maintaining physical activity as you age, because that helps you control um, your body weight and body fatness, but also promotes maintenance of muscle mass and function. So, so keeping up your physical activity, maintaining a healthy diet, and that's what we've all been talking about, um, and all the things that, that make up a healthy diet and getting the balances right. And then the third thing, I think, is maintaining social interaction. Um, and this is really important for older people, especially, I mean, both around mobility, so the physical aspect, but also the cognitive aspect. So I think those would be my three, like, big ticket items. Um, of course, each of those is complex, but those are the things I'd really focus on. So thank you so much. If any, Dr. Harnett or Dr. Dulceman, any comments? Um, I, I would just add that... Um, being being aware of uh, medications that actually deplete nutrients in older people is a, is an important consideration, um, and we know there are several of those. Um, I published a paper with some colleagues um, last year on that topic, particularly in the elderly, mm -hmm. that um, you could refer to um, as a, some summary there. And the other thing that I'd like to add to, to what uh, Philip has said is around social engagement. And as people age, their social engagement may be less and there may be less motivation to eat well. Yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, promoting communities yeah. and making yeah. older people aware of the places in which that they can um, engage with others and eat a good meal. Um, but very basic again, but sometimes those simple things can make an overall difference to frailty. Sure, Dr. Abdul Saman, anything? I think uh, my colleagues answered this very greatly. No thing to add. No further comments. Okay, thank you so much. So um, uh, the next question I would like it to address uh, address it uh, firstly to Dr. Harnett. Uh, we've had uh, um, um, a few questions about. Uh, supplements and allergies, not, not in terms of direct allergies, but how can supplements support uh, allergic patients uh, to suffer less, less, less uh, different allergies? Uh, uh, also maybe asthma and uh, other illnesses related to that. And uh, I would add, uh, 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 what about uh, uh, the, the role that some uh, food uh, uh, can have related to allergy, uh, especially those that have uh, high levels of histamine. Mm -hmm. If you could please answer that. Yeah, I might draw on um, Philip's expertise in the field of immunology around this, um, uh, but I, I actually might answer the, qu uh, answer the question in reverse in some ways to say that there are particular herbs that actually can 
um, uh, cause hypersensitivity um, that are commonly used in immune function. And I know in Australia, we've seen an increase in adverse um, drug reactions to two herbs used in immunity, andrographis, paniculata, um, and also another one called echinacea, which um, Basma touched on. So both those, in fact, um, should be used in caution in those with asthma, hay fever, and known allergies. Um, so uh, in regards to supplements that can, can be used to reduce allergy, I'm not aware of any particular supplement that can do that. Um, I may be out of date or, or non-educated on that, so I can defer to Philip and Basma on that. Yeah, so I think this is a really interesting area because um, an allergy is an adverse immunological reaction um, to something that shouldn't create a strong immunological reaction. So something has gone wrong with the immune system. And this might be a genetic predisposition or the combination of a genetic predisposition and some other factor. Now, of course, there are allergies to foods, which can be common. So um, the most obvious thing there is, you know, avoiding the food. Once you're sensitized to it, you know, food avoidance is, is crucial. And I mean, people, that, that's sort of obvious, but it's worth saying. Um, I mean, that is, that is the uh, way to avoid the condition. Um, there has been some interest in, um, so, so the allergic response is, a, is an immuno-inflammatory response, and it's very well defined immunologically, um, and, you know, Basma has, I think, uh, spent a lot of time studying that. So there has been some interest in whether there are specific nutrients that can sort of interrupt or decrease the intensity of this uh, allergic response related to, to allergy. And, you know, people have been interested in antioxidants, um, omega-3 fatty acids, and there has been research in these areas, but I don't think there's really very good evidence that once a person becomes allergic, you can use um, nutrients in a pharmacological way to dampen the condition. Um, mm -hmm. Theoretically, you know, omega-3s should work because of the involvement of arachidonic acid-derived um, metabolites like leukotrienes. You know, the drugs target leukotrienes um, or anti-asthmatic drugs, but omega-3s themselves don't work very well. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't rely upon a supplement to control the allergic condition um, if, I'm, if I'm honest with you. Um, I mean, Basma, I don't know what your view is, having studied that area. Uh, yes, uh, about uh, the supplements, I think there is no supplement to enhance the allergy. Instead, the best way for the allergies is to avoid the supplement, avoid the herb, avoid the food that cause you the allergy. Yeah, sure. Not, not, not the verse. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's interesting, sorry to come back, but so, so in, in allergy, there's two different phases. So one is what they call sensitization, which is actually setting up the system to become allergic. And the other is the response once you are sensitized. So like, um, you know, an anaphylactic response, for example, the typical response is if anyone's allergic, they'll know um, the, you know, the throat, the mouth, the eyes, all those things. <laughs> so, um, for the sensitization, that's really interesting because there's a lot of debate about um, whether avoiding potential allergens is the key to stopping people becoming sensitized or whether exposing them to potential allergens is, is the key. And that's a, really, um, that's a really interesting research area because um, there's a very good big trial that's been done that shows introducing peanuts very early in life, which, I mean, here in the UK, our government advised pregnant women to avoid peanuts to stop their children becoming peanut allergic. And that's probably advice that's global. But actually, the research has shown that very early introduction of peanuts reduces the risk of peanut allergy. So it's almost like you're educating your immune system that this is something not to worry about. And if it doesn't get that exposure, when you suddenly get hit with peanuts and your immune system's never seen them before, it doesn't know how to respond. 
So I think, you know, I'm not, um, I'm not promoting going out and giving peanuts to everybody, but it's really interesting how this view of sensitization has changed um, or is changing with research. So it's a sort of a watch the space, I think. Mm. And I'll probably just add one, one more thing, but such an interesting, important quest, um, uh, discussion we're having is coming circling back to the gut microbiota and that there is, you know, a, a number of studies um, and a number of ongoing pieces of research around probiotics um, in that preventative of allergy um, mm. during, during pregnancy and um, different um, early phases of childhood. Um, again, the evidence is still building and we can't categorically say these are going to be effective, but certainly the logic makes sense that if we have a, a varied and um, uh, broad, uh, healthy, diverse microbiota, we're going to have better immunoregulation. Okay, so uh, uh, it's uh, time to finish the, this webinar. I, I really think it was super interesting, very practical. Thank you to Joanna, Philip, and Basma for your availability, time, and expertise. It's been a pleasure uh, to be listening to you. Thank you to all our, of our attendees that are uh, in every, from every part of the world. Thank you for being with us. Uh, it's time to say goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thanks Thank very you. much, everybody. Bye now. Yeah,